Good morning. How are we all? Sorry. Normally when I do this, somebody comes up and does the announcement. So I'm sort of stood here thinking, is something going to happen? But obviously not. Paul, did you want to do any announcements or anything? Shall I just... <laughs> there you go. If you didn't hear that, see Paul afterwards and he'll fill you in on the detail. It's good to be with you. Thank you. We had a, an uneventful journey down. You will be pleased to hear. Um, although that 50 mile an hour speed bit on the M27 does tend to slow things down a bit, doesn't it? Still only another seven years to go, so it won't, it's not a problem. Let's, uh, let's start by singing some praise to the Lord, shall we? Uh, for those of you using a book, number 560. Five, I've got 560 on my notes, Colin. I was given 560. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Yep, good, that's good. You're in good voice. Please be seated. Let's spend a little time, shall we, in prayer together. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before God as we come to him in prayer. I'm sure there are things on each one of our hearts that perhaps aren't known to other people. So let's take a moment of silence and just share the things that are on our hearts personally with the Father who loves us and longs to bless us. Father, we thank you that you hear the silent words of our hearts as we come to you in prayer this morning. We lift every one of this congregation before you, whatever their age, whatever their experience, whatever their skills, whatever the issues there are in our lives, Father, we lift them before you and we ask that right at the outset of this meeting, you pour your Holy Spirit on this place and on each one of us. 
that we will know what it means to experience your presence here in this building and within our lives. Father, we long to be in tune with your will. We long to live your way in this world that you have created. Father, we pray this morning as we come to consider what that might mean, how that might work out in practice. We pray, Father, that you will help us to order our lives, to hear what it is that you have to say, and to be able to order our lives to fit in with your will and your desires for us. Father, we look at the world around us, we see so much that is of concern to us. News again overnight of yet more uh, inhumanity from man to man as we hear of wars spreading, of violence, of damage, of injury, of death. Father, these are things that we know that you don't desire, that you don't want in the world any more than, than we do. Father, your, your aim, your plan is that we should live in peace. Father, we thank you that Jesus came to bring peace. And Father, we pray that you will help us, your people, to spread that message and that you, by your Holy Spirit, will touch the lives of every single person that we might see an end to war that we might again see cooperation between men and women and children and that we might all support each other and bring an end to so many of the things that we are responsible for yet father there are things that happen in this world that we're not responsible for they are the consequence of the world around us being in in a damaged state. So, Father, we ask, too, that you stay your hand wherever possible, that you protect people. We pray particularly for your church worldwide, and we lift it to you, Father, and we ask for your hand of blessing on it. We ask, Father, that you enlarge your kingdom. And as we come back to ourselves and consider this time together this morning, Father, we pray for those that are not here. For whatever reason, we lift them before you. We ask your blessing on them. And we pray, Father, that as we read your word, as we sing these songs, as we consider some of the work that we are able to do together, and as we hear your word expounded to us, Father, we pray that you will be completely in control of all things and move mightily amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing again, shall we? See if I can get this number right. 1295, 1295. I lift my hands to the coming King, to the great I am, to you I sing, for you are the one who reigns within my heart. If we're able, we'll stand and sing. 1295 if you're following in a book.
Excellent. Thank you. We're going to uh, we're going to read together. Do please be seated. Sorry. Thank you. We're going to read together. Um, we're jumping around quite a lot in the verses that I've been given, and when we get to the pass to the message itself, you'll find that I've got a lot of verses that we're not even reading. So there you go. That's the way it's going to work this morning. So you might find it easier rather than trying to jump around your Bible if I just read those verses through um, from the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Proverbs. And, uh, and then we'll, I'll ask Abby to come up. So if you start getting yourself ready, Abby, where I can't see you. Oh, she's not here. Is somebody taking over to do th- No, we're not bothering. Okay, cool. You want to do it? Yeah. Cool. Penny's going to do it. <laughs> no, sorry. I, was, I, was, I thought, oh, that's impressive. <laughs> Book of Proverbs. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. There is a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. Mockers resent correction. So they avoid the wise. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge to a listening ear. That's it, isn't it? That's all of them. That was it, sorry. Yeah. Didn't need the one I did here. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so Abby was going to talk to us about shoebox, but I guess she'll do that another week. I've asked Maureen if we can perhaps do a, do a kid's song. Um, I didn't bring any words, but you may have the words. I don't know how quickly you can get them up if you have, but you'll know this anyway because it's so well known. You won't have a problem with it. Yeah, no, come on. You, I'm, it's, it's all in anticipation. Oh, you'll find out in a minute, won't you? Sounds like Colin might come and help you. No? Come on, kids, you know you want to. Yeah. <laughs> Josh and Colin, it is then. <laughs> We've got people in our church that are adults that would come up and do it, you know. Well done, Kathy. Well done, Penny. Big God, our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and He holds us in His hands. He's higher than a skyscraper and He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And He loves me and He loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and He holds us in His hands. His hands. And He holds us in His hands. And He holds us in His hands. Hey, well done. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Absolutely. 
<laughs> we're going to sing again. I think we're doing two on the trot. Is that right? Uh, musicians, is that right? Two and two on a run? Uh, there is a Redeemer and what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? I think I've got no number for the second of those. The first is 673, there is a Redeemer. The second one I don't have a number so I assume we're just going to have to use the words on the screen.
Fabulous, thank you. Do please be seated. I hadn't heard that before. That was like standing in front of a choir. That was fabulous. You were good, really good. I think the youngsters are leaving us. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. Sorry, should I have announced that before the hymn? Let's pray for the youngsters as they, as they make their way to their classes. Father, we thank you for these amazing young people. We thank you for the gift that they are to us. And we pray, Father, that as they go with their teachers, that you will pour out your blessing on them that you will fill them with joy, with excitement and pleasure as they serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps we should pray also for for us in here. Let's just pray for this time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that we can learn from it. And as we take some time now to think on the subject of wisdom, we pray, Father, that you will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard the story once of a wise of a man who was given three wishes. He was told he could be the richest man in the world, he could be the most handsome man in the world, or he could be the wisest man in the world. He thought about it for a while and he decided that he would choose to be the wisest man in the world. And bang, there he was, the wisest man in the world, and he immediately knew he should have taken the money. There you go. Uh, Some say that wisdom, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. (laughs) I don't know. There we go. We're going to think this morning on this subject of wisdom, which really is a, a central theme, really, about what it means to be a Christian. I was hobnobbing it a a few weeks ago with uh, the Bishop of Basingstoke. There you go, David Williams, a great guy. And he was talking at a a meeting that I was at, and he he was explaining something in a way that I'd not really heard before, which I found incredibly helpful. And what he said was that God has a plan for the world. God is working his purposes out right the way through history. There is a course on which the world is set, and God is directing that and making it happen. And very often we sort of get things the wrong way round, um, because we think we get God in our lives and that's how we move on. But actually, the thing really is that we need to get in tune with God's plan. That's what God is asking us as human beings to do. I have a plan. This is how it's going to work out. If you want to be happy, if you want to have peace, if you want to have joy, the best way you can do it is to get in line with my plan. Because if you stay outside of my plan, things are going to get difficult and bumpy because you're not on the right road. You need to get in line with my plan. I suspect, I'm sure, every one of us here, every person on the planet really, wants to experience joy and contentment. That's what we want from our lives. We want to be, um, we we aspire to be happy, I suppose. And we're, we're thinking this morning really about how does that happen? Where, how does wisdom fit into that? What it means to be happy will vary from person to person. But the truth is that we do all long and look for it. But the pursuit of happiness can lead us in all sorts of different directions. And I'm sure we can all agree that however we interpret the ultimate goal of our individual lives... We need to seek fulfillment in ways that fit in with God's ways, that are moral, that are in line with what God wants for us as individuals and in line with that much bigger plan of what is going on in the world. We want to be good. And being good really means finding happiness in ways that please and honour God. I don't know, do we sometimes think that we have to choose between doing what's right and being happy? I want us to try to understand this morning that that's not how how things work. God has made this world so that 
doing good, fitting in with his plan, especially when it comes to faith in Christ, eventually brings us more happiness. The world so often thinks that they're going to have to give up things. They're going to lose out somehow by getting into a relationship with Jesus. But the fact is we don't have to choose between happiness and God's glory. Because the truth is that the more we honour and glorify God, the happier we will be. Because that's how God has designed the world. So in the book of Proverbs, as you've been going through it, we have a wise teacher. The first nine chapters of Proverbs are really encouraging us to want to be wise. And from chapter 10 onwards, we're enrolled in the school of wisdom that Solomon and his Proverbs offer. So I want to say to you this morning, welcome to the school of wisdom, because that's where we are. I think it's important to understand that these Proverbs don't necessarily give us absolute answers, but they give us principles with which we can work. They're training us to think. And it's as we chew over those words, as we cogitate on them, that's then how they become part of the way that we live our lives. People often define the book of Proverbs by what it doesn't include. So they'll say there's no divine intervention in this book. There's no covenant references. There's no promises of the messianic age. And they're all things that we're familiar with in Scripture and yeah, perhaps they are missing a little bit here. But the major theme of the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. We are to fear the Lord. Not in the sense that we cower and, and back, but that theme of reverent, being reverent towards God, taking on board his way of thinking, accepting that his ways are not our ways. We don't think as he thinks and therefore we need to retune our lives is the great theme that plays all the way through the Old Testament, whether it's in the law revealing the character of God, or the prophets, where they come as preachers of the Torah to the peoples of the day, or to the narratives, which recall the actions and God's explanations of the actions. The whole intent of the Old Testament is that the people are encouraged and cajoled and pushed towards getting in with God's big plan for the world and changing their way of thinking. The name of the Lord, I am, needs to be at the centre of our motivation. And it can be because we go to the theme of the faithfulness of God and how he brings people into a covenant relationship with him. Wherever that name Yahweh is there, I am who I am. I will never be different. I am always the same. We are to remember that this is about the God who makes and keeps his promises. He says to his people, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we find ourselves in a place where we are in relationship with God, we are willing to submit to his will as revealed in Scripture, whether that's the law given by Moses, the Proverbs, the focus may be different in different books, 
but the God of the Bible, that covenant God who is teaching us his character, who is teaching us to relate that character to some of the enigmas and the challenges of life, is there right the way through Scripture. And the book of Proverbs sits alongside a world that has been amazingly and intricately crafted by a benevolent creator with faithfulness to Jesus and adherence to the precepts that God has set out will yield joy in the fullness of time. We do well, I think, to understand that the fabric of existence is woven such that the pursuit of divine glory inherently enriches our personal happiness. The more fervently we exalt the divine, the more profound and enduring becomes our happiness. Oh, if only the world could grasp that level of understanding. But I need to say too that being a Christian doesn't mean that there's no discipline or self-denial. Jesus himself said, if anyone wants to follow me, let them say no to themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the good news will save it. Jesus teaches us that self-denial is a way to save our lives. It means we need to stop seeking happiness in one way and start seeking it in another. And what makes the Christian different from the rest of the world isn't that we've given up on wanting to be happy. No, no, we want to be happy as much as anybody else. But instead, we've learned to seek happiness from a different place and in different ways. We've learned from Jesus, who, as Hebrews tells us, endured the cross because of the joy that was waiting for him. We've learned, as Romans tells us, that sometimes finding joy might mean we have to suffer for Christ's sake. But we shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves because the suffering we face now isn't worth comparing to the glory that God will reveal to us. Romans 8, verse 18. But we're not to become proud either because suffering produces patience, which leads to approval and approval leads to hope. The hope is that God will restore our happiness many times over. So there's a balance to be struck there. We can't brag about our sufferings because they're all leading us to greater happiness in God. But the main point that I want to convey this morning to us today is that we should seek wisdom. It should be the goal of today to become wiser. Every day we should be asking ourselves the question, am I wiser today than I was yesterday? I have to say that one of the things I retired about a month ago, I'm pleased to say I'm free, and one of the things that I find particularly good is that no longer do I have to worry about that dreaded continual professional development constantly looking for things. It was always a bit of a bore to have to scratch around to find teaching programs of things that I really wasn't interested in at all. I think it's important to understand that we can't buy wisdom. They're not things that you can buy with tuition fees, booking into classes, Wisdom comes from a daily, lifelong journey of growth. And we should never think that the only way to grow in understanding is by taking more courses. It's not like that. When the wise person talks to us in Proverbs 5, verse 4, 5, he, sorry, Proverbs 4, verse 5, he says, get wisdom, get insight. He's not saying go to school, take more classes. He's telling us to get wisdom. What does this mean? How do we do it? And why is it so important? 
Well, let's start by asking why it's so important. I think we've already answered that question. The reason getting wisdom is crucial is that it's the practical knowledge by which we achieve true and lasting happiness. Proverbs 3.13 tells us, happy is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. Proverbs 24 says, my child, eat honey for it is good and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is the same for your soul. If you find it, there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. So in simpler terms, wisdom opens the door to a future filled with hope. It's the key to long-lasting happiness. Proverbs 19, those who acquire wisdom benefit themselves. So I think God might be saying to you this morning, saying to me this morning, to us, do, you, do yourselves a favour. Get some wisdom. Proverbs 8, 32 to 36 beautifully summarises it all. In that passage, wisdom herself is speaking and she says, Listen, my sons, listen to me. Happy are those who follow my ways. Happy is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For those who find me, find life and receive favour from the Lord. But those who miss me harm themselves. All who hate me love death. If we don't make it our goal to get wisdom, if we don't make it the aim of our life to fit in with God's plan, to understand his ways and want to live them out eventually, that will lead to death. That's why the command is to get wisdom, get insight. Getting wisdom is better than gold. Acquiring understanding is more desirable than silver because it's a matter of life and death. The ultimate everlasting happiness that everyone desires will only be found by those who first get wisdom, by those who identify with God. I want to emphasize that ultimate and everlasting happiness comes from wisdom because not all happiness is rooted in wisdom. Proverbs 15 tells us that folly brings joy to one who has no sense. Our thirst for happiness is unquenchable in this world. And without the wisdom to seek it in God, what we do is settle for substitutes found in the world. So executives might chase after promotions. Athletes might seek records. Scholars might aim to get their works published. Gamblers find solace going to the casino. Musicians long to have platinum records. The sources people turn to for happiness apart from God are countless alcohol, drugs, leisure, technology. But the happiness those things provide isn't lasting and it isn't genuine. It's not the ultimate joy that God wants you and I to experience. It's not the ultimate joy for which we have been created. So it leaves us feeling unsatisfied, frustrated, incomplete, sensing that there must be more. You see, the ultimate and eternal happiness we seek, that we crave for, that we desperately desire, is found only through getting with the program getting inside with God's plan and walking with God's plan throughout the world as he works his purposes out through history. So how do we know whether we're doing that? How do we fit in with that? 
Well, the first characteristic I've mentioned already, and it's well known, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. True wisdom leading to life and ultimate joy starts with knowing God. To fear the Lord really means realizing how daunting it is to stop trusting and depending on God to meet our needs. Imagine what would life must be like if you don't rely on God to meet our needs. So it's not only the first step, but it's also the foundation from which everything else will flow. We need to guard against pride. Proverbs 11 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. So if you're going to be wise, if we're going to be wise, we need to be humble. The wise person embodies humility. You see, a proud person doesn't fear the Lord. God detests arrogance. And if we're proud and we say, well, I know it all, I don't need God in my life, then we can't even begin to acquire wisdom. But someone who fears the Lord is humble because they know that they rely on God for everything. And they don't want to take credit for what God does. That would be a mistake. And humility lays the groundwork for other elements of godly wisdom because it fosters a teachable spirit, if you like. When we're humble, we're willing to learn. We're willing to change. We're open to God working in our lives. Whereas the proud person dislikes admitting mistakes or acknowledging the need for improvement. So as believers in God, we welcome advice. We welcome, we value reason. And we're open to being corrected in the pursuit of truth. Humility, unlike pride, doesn't shy away from being instructed or commanding. If we're going to be wise, we need to be humble. Because wisdom involves knowing and obeying what God would teach us. Deuteronomy says, see, I have taught you decrees and laws. This is Moses speaking. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them. Observe them carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. And we follow Jesus, of course, who said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So a good definition of godly wisdom then is listening to and obeying God's word. God's word is, if you like, a divine prescription for how to ultimately overcome unhappiness. Wisdom is the practical knowledge of how to attain that happiness. And wisdom really is about hearing and doing what God says and humbly relying on him for help. That's really what it means to fear the Lord. To see that we cannot get true, lasting happiness anywhere but in Him. We need to fear being apart from Him. Because then we are separated from His will and His direction. And we need to come into his presence and say, Father, I long to live your way in your world because you are working out the plans of history as year succeeds to year. But it's not sufficient, is it, just to simply define it as humble obedience to God's word because 
God's word doesn't always address every human direct, direct dilemma directly. You'll remember the story of the, the two women who came to King Solomon, both claiming to be the mother of the same baby. And Solomon said, well, fetch me a sword, and what I'll do is I'll cut the baby in half, and you can have half each. And one woman protested, preferring to relinquish her claim rather than see the child harmed, while the other one said, no, that's fine, I'll go with that. And Solomon used that to discern the true mother. And his wisdom was recognised by everyone. In, in that situation, there was no specific Bible command guiding Solomon's decision. There was nothing that he could use in that way to go, right, this is what I should do. <coughs> so wisdom has to extend beyond mere obedience to God's word. It needs us to mature so that we can take those principles that we are chewing over in the book of Proverbs and work out how they should influence our decisions in circumstances that the Bible doesn't specifically address. I think that's why Paul said we need to be constantly renewing our minds. Keep going back, keep chewing things over, keep thinking about things, enabling us to discern and approve what God thinks of, what God believes in certain situations. We won't always work it out. We can't think the way that God thinks. But as we have the right heart to be wise, he will give us, as in Colossians it says, spiritual wisdom. Our prayer should be that we will be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we should note that the wisdom derived from God's word and the wisdom needed to investigate situations where there isn't clear guidance. They're not separate things. It's as we immerse ourselves in the word of God that we cultivate the spiritual wisdom that is necessary to guide us in all circumstances. So when the Bible says get wisdom, it refers to getting the practical knowledge of how to attain true and lasting happiness. And the journey begins with fear of the Lord and it entails humbly listening to and obeying God's will, both as revealed in Scripture and as discerned in the unique circumstances of each moment. And that's how we will find joy. And that call to get wisdom is urgent and it's crucial. So how do we get it? Well, the first thing is want it. Desire it intently. Even to the point of giving up other things so that you can get to be wise like God. Dedicate ourselves to the Word of God, to studying it, to meditating on it, to letting it become a part of who we are so that we can live it out. And thirdly, pray for wisdom. Ask God to give it to you, especially when you lack it. Because true wisdom ultimately is a supernatural gift. And the fourth thing I would encourage us to do is to think about how brief life is. Think how short our lives really are and how long eternity is going to be. What should we be working for? What should we be thinking about? Psalm 90 encourages us to number our days to gain wisdom. Reflecting on the shortness of life helps us clarify our priorities and leads us to seek the wisdom of God.
And finally, the most essential step in acquiring wisdom is to come to Jesus. Jesus surpasses even Solomon in his very in his wisdom because he was and is God incarnate. To know, love and follow Jesus is to possess the ultimate treasure of wisdom and inter- and eternal happiness. Therefore, the command to get wisdom ultimately means come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, who embodies all the treasures of wisdom. Give your life to the one who came to give you life. We need to get in with the program. God has a plan for this world, and if we're sitting outside of it, we're missing out. If we want to know what it is to be truly happy, we need to get in with God's program. We need to get in line with what it is that he is doing and ask him to fill us with his wisdom so that we can work with him in changing this world one person at a time. God bless you, help you, and encourage you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. So I'm just looking for the number. 488. 488, O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive thy church with life and power. O breath of life, come cleanse, renew us and fit thy church to meet this hour. Perfect song for what we've just thought about. Let's stand as we sing together, shall we? Let's just bow our heads and pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We earnestly seek, Father, that you make us wise, that you show us your will. For any Lord here this morning who've never come to Jesus, we pray, Father, for them especially, 
that they will see that he is the source of everything that we need in life. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch each one of us, that we will take away from this morning something that is what you want us to learn and put it into practice so that we come in line with your plan and your will, both for our lives and for this world. And we find the purpose that you have already prepared for us as we live out the rest of our days here on earth. We look forward to eternity with you. And we look forward, Father, to hearing those wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So, Father, we commit each other into your hands. We thank you for your presence with us. We ask, Father, that your grace, your love, and your mercy go with us as we spend the rest of the day doing whatever we're doing, and we look forward to the remainder of the week in company with you. In Jesus' name, amen.